Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of a truly great woman, a great South Carolinian, a great American, who has Secretary Riley aptly termed a force of justice. Would you please join me in welcoming to the dais the 91st inductee to the official South Carolina Hall of Fame, Dr. Marion Wright Edelman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I had great parents, and they tried to live their faith. And I had great community co-parents, and they were named Miss T and Miss Kate Winston, and Miss, oh my goodness, it's so wonderful. Think of all of them who kept me when mom and daddy left town and didn't make me eat vegetables <laughs> and let me do whatever I wanted to do. But we had great community co-parents and the community-owned children that we were doing something we, didn't supposed to, we weren't supposed to do, they told on us before we could get home. And our teachers didn't always have the same resources as the teachers in the schools, but they made sure we learned what we needed to know. Um, and they were our Sunday school teachers and my seventh grade teacher, Ms. Johnson, was my brownie scout leader. And it took community caring for children. Nobody raises a child alone. And that cocoon of caring and the buffer against the external world that told black children we weren't worth much didn't get through because we were told it wasn't, you know, that, that we were God's child. And that, that, that our worth as sacred human beings um, could not be determined by that and that we had problems in the world but that we all could change them. And there was never a time from the youngest child, when I was the youngest child, that I didn't always know I was going to change the thing that kept some children from having what all children have. And we still have a great challenge having that, but I'm so grateful for the village and the community of Bennisville. And we've got to reweave that fabric of family and reweave that family of community. People say, oh my goodness, what has happened to children today? The issue is what has happened to adults today? And we adults have got to get it back together and reweave that fabric of caring and community and putting our children first. And I just love thinking back to all the, Ms. T. Kelly and Ms. All, and they used to send us greasy dollar bills and chicken boxes down to Spelman because they didn't have an education with their wives, but they wanted to make sure that we children felt valued. And I've always felt that we had to give back. And I've always struggled and still do every morning try to get up and be half as good is those people of faith and grit. And then I went off to Spelman College and there was Dr. Mage preaching to us in Sunday morning chapel and Spelman's compulsory chapel and Dr. Mordecai Johnson and Dr. Howard Thurman and Dr. King um, came through Spelman's chapel and I hated compulsory chapel. I don't like being told I got to do something. I don't like to be told I can't do something. But I look back now and I remember what I learned in chapel from these great speakers more than I remember any of my classes. And when I got to be chairman of the Spelman Board, the first thing I did was to reinstitute compulsory chapel <laughs> so that young people would know what we adults feel were, was important and that service was important, that caring and giving back and that we need to create that next generation of servant leaders because we were created as servant leaders. So those of us who had an education had an obligation to give back and to use that education to bring others up with us. And that's why we bought Alex Haley Farm to teach us our history because our nice, wonderful friend has said here, if you don't know your history, you're gonna repeat it. And we don't need to go backwards, we must go forward. And we must include every child in that American dream. Um, I heard Dr. King first in Spelman's Chapel, compulsory chapel, and two of his things I wanna just remind you of today. He said to take the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase, take the first step in faith and leave the rest to God. And so a lot of times you don't know what step two and three and you can't be guaranteed success, but you take that first step. And I'll tell you sometimes I wish God would come earlier, but he will really take the seeds that you plant. You just take that step that is right and you leave the results to God. And the second thing he said and that first time I heard him when I was 20 in that chapel, was the importance of moving forward. He said, if you can't fly, you drive. If you can't drive, you run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl, but you keep moving forward. 
And we have moved forward thanks to the sacrifice of incredible people, many of them poor. I mean, I went back to Mississippi and there was Miss Hamer and Miss Mayberth the Carter and all these ordinary people of grace like the people in Bennettsville. And Ms. Osceola McCartan, they became very famous when she left $150,000 to Mississippi State um, to give scholarships. She was a maid. She took what she needed to live and she saved the rest and she gave it to give the next generation a chance to get an education. And everybody said this was absolutely extraordinary. Whoever could have thought of this? Well, I said, I knew a lot of Ms. Osceola's in Bennettsville. They didn't have $150,000 they gave back and prepared the future. And you and I, have an obligation to pass on a country that's better than we found it and to make sure that our children and our wonderful grandchildren have a better life than we do. And we're in great danger of moving backwards. And I want to just say wake up and be clear about what we've got to do to make America move towards being America. An old clipping my sister Olive sent me was about the lessons that I learned, all the lessons I need in life, you need in life, you learn from Noah's Ark. And I want to just remind us of a few of them today before I sit down. First lesson from Noah's Ark, this anonymous sage said, was don't miss the boat. And the United States is going to miss the boat to the future if we don't invest in educating our children. We are not going to be able to compete in a globalizing world if 60% of all of our children in fourth and eighth grade can't read at grade level, if 75% of all of our Latino children and 80% of all of our black children cannot read at grade level or compute at grade level in fourth and eighth grade, um, and we know what the high school dropout rates are, um, you're not going to get there. We're going to move backwards. Um, and I think we've got to wake up and invest in educating every one of South Carolina's children. If 74% of our children, 17 to 24, can't get in the military because they can't read, they have health problems, they uh, have a prior incarceration record, we're not going to have a strong military. If we don't have the kind of education system that's going to prepare our folk to compete in the, the economic arena, to build the jobs, to build the leaders, to build the diplomatic core, we're going to go backwards. And if we don't break up this cradle to prison pipeline, which is victimizing one in three black children, one in six, one in five Latino boys. And so I'm so happy to see this role model here. You escape, but many of them don't escape and we've got to get them out of those prisons and get them into college. It is really dumb for us to be spending two and a half times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. Wake up, open up these church doors, have an alternative to the street, compete with the drug dealers, and get our children reclaimed. And so this is really what the adult job is. That's what our parents did. That's what you've got to do. The second is to recognize we're all in the same boat. And we may not like these poor black and Latina children, but we're going to need them all. And there are a majority of our two-year-olds and unders, they're going to be in five years. They're going to be a majority of all of our children. We need to educate them and have them work and be a part of this country and to be an example of what a democracy can be in a, in a world that is two-thirds majority, a majority non-white. We've got an opportunity, but we will continue to separate and to uninvest in our neediest children at our own peril. We are all in the same boat. And we better recognize that. And we're being given another opportunity to move forward toward being a decent America that welcomes every child. The third is the plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. And we always, in this quick fix, profit-driven quarterly culture, um, tend to talk about what is going to happen next week or two years. America's future lies right now in these young people who are here today and their education and their health care. And we can't wait around. Um, and we've got to have a sense of urgency, but we've got to plan ahead for the future. And the fourth lesson, and I'm almost done now, is that we've got um, to recognize that um, Noah built the ark with amateurs. The Titanic was built by experts. <laughs> And too often when we want to bring about change, we're looking for that next great leader to tell us what to do. It is not leaders, it is all of us have to be engaged in building a movement. It takes the September Clarks and the Mrs. Rosa Parks and those ordinary people, Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer, sharecroppers, they are the ones who changed America. And Dr. King always understood that he didn't cause the civil rights movement, he responded. He responded to the demand from the communities and we have got to have that same kind of transforming movement that's gonna come out of the citizens of our country. 
Dr. King in his last year was very depressed and he thought that we were integrating, though he said he'd worked for integration all over again, that he will, we were integrating into a burning house that was going to be destroyed unless we confronted the excessive materialism, the excessive militarism, the excessive racism and poverty that infected us. And people were shocked when they heard him say that, and they asked him, well, what, what should we do? And he says, we've all got to sound the alarm and become firemen. And I just think that I'm just going to be a firewoman. It's, wake up. Wake up. We're going to go backwards. We cannot go and leave our children to fight the same battles we fought. We've got to end child poverty in this country. We've got to get every child ready for school. If America is going to be competitive and if America is going to become America. So adults, let's get our act together. Let's get our priorities straight because we don't do it. We're going to let it go back on our watch and we cannot do that. I am so proud of what you have done um, today. And I will just end with the Poor People's Campaign because we had moved to Washington from Mississippi um, to get ready and prepare the position papers for the Poor People's Campaign. And then Dr. King got assassinated. 1968 was a terrible year. And a few weeks later, Dr. Robert Kennedy got assassinated. But Dr. King got assassinated. And there were riots all over America of hopelessness and brokenheartedness. And, um, Riots occurred in Washington, and children were looting in the schools and down the streets. And our hearts were broken. And I went out into the schools and the streets in D.C. and told the young people not to ride and not to loot and not to ruin their futures. And a 12-year-old black boy looked me straight in the eye and said, Lady, what future? I ain't got no future. I ain't got nothing to lose. And I have spent the last 45 years, 40 years with the Children's Defense Fund, and will spend the rest of my life trying to, to prove that boy's truth wrong. In our militarily powerful, in our economically powerful, but in our spiritually poor nation, America is going to move backwards. And I don't want to see when we come before the throne of God, God asking us, you know, whether we treated all of his children fairly. So the biggest issue we have all got to face is to be good parents, to reweave that fabric of community, to live what we preach, because our children don't do what we tell them to do. They do what we do. And so we adults need to shape up. We also need to show our children we're going to place them first. And it's time for a new movement to end child poverty, to see that every one of our children have health care, to see that every one of our children has enough to eat, that our children have a place to sleep. I don't mind our billionaires. I would not deny anybody their first or second billionaires if there are no homeless children. If there are no hungry children, let's change that.